I would like to invite my friend Jenny to come and join us. Now, Jenny will be known to some of you and not known at all to others of you. So I'm going to introduce you. Is that okay? This is Jenny. Say hello to Jenny. <laughs> See, you're just among friends now. It's lovely. Uh, Jenny is, I'm going to call you an amateur historian. Is that fair? Or are you a professional historian? Amateur. amateur. Okay. So just because you don't get paid for it doesn't mean you're not very good at it, though. So Jenny has been doing uh, some historical research into our church for the last couple of years, probably a bit more than that, and has an astonishing array of information about the history of our church. And this morning, we're going to have a look at one particular facet of that, and that is the missionary history of this church. This church has done some remarkable things in the past uh, to show, uh, to, to tell of the good news of Jesus all over the world. And we're going to hear about that. And Jenny's done all this out of the goodness of her heart for us. We, we didn't even really ask her to do it in the first place. And she just came, she said to me one day, she said, could, could I have an hour to go through the history of the church with you? I thought, oh, that'll be an interesting hour. Well, it took maybe closer to four. Um, but uh, we went through the whole history. And it's, it's astonishing. And I'm reminded, it could feel, so we decided we would do this today. And we're doing on September the 23rd as part of Doors Open Day. You're all invited to come and join us. And we'll have a, a, a story that tells something of this building uh, and of the people of this church in this community uh, over the hundred or so years that we've been uh, involved in the community. But the thing that I, I was reminded of when we decided we were going to do this on a Sunday morning, I thought, it's a bit of a weird service, uh, a bit different. We'll do it at the end of the summer. It'll be dead quiet. Yeah, okay. Um, but also, here's the thing, when we read in the scriptures, we see that the Israelites paused often in the calendar year, and one of the things they did was say, we're going to tell our old stories. We're going to look back and see, this is what we did in the past, and they didn't do it so they could say, oh, I wish it was like it was back then, because churches have never done that ever at all, going, oh, it wasn't like that in my day. But what they did was look back and say, remember when God was with us? Remember when God did this amazing thing? In order that they could say, and surely he's with us today, and we'll do this again. And so that's what we want to do this morning. We're going to hear sto a story of history, but we want to look at it with a heart of faith. And so what is it that God is calling us to? Jenny, thank you so much for being here. And over to you. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Is it, can you hear me? Yeah. Is that all right? Good. So I've been given about half an hour, but I have to warn you, I do get very interested in the people. So you can wave at me if it's just going a bit too much. Um, so what I'd like to do before moving into the actual... Um, <laughs> See, I told them I'd do something upside down. There we go. Right. Before uh, moving into the actual people, I just wanted to give you a wee bit of background about the outreach from this church. And start with an important question. So Glenn's been talking about sowing the seed. Why would people leave the comfort of their homes here to go to the other side of the world to talk about something and to experience a lot of difficulties well it's only one reason and that reason is the Lord Jesus Christ so they had come to know him they loved him and they wanted to go and tell other people about him and you think about all of us in this room somebody loved us enough to tell us the good news and we can then go and tell others and so this story now is really about the good news, the gospel. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The news that we had rebelled against God, but that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us so that we could come into God's family. He took our punishment on that cross so that we could come to know him. So we then have forgiveness and we have hope. Don't we all need hope these days? So that's the message. 
I'm hoping to tell you a lot more about these people um, in September, but these four people were the original people in the 1890s who started the church, and their names are important to some of the missionaries that came next. Pastor David Tate on the left, uh, Reverend John Wallace, now his family and uh, we have been looking for a photo. We've not yet found one, but uh, it's not for lack of looking. Mrs. Cleghorn, this photo came from Belize, where her son went um, as a pastor. So possibly before the church was founded, almost like a pre-missionary <laughs> from Mrs. Cleghorn's family. And um, Archibald McGill, a military man. Now you'll hear some of these names a wee bit uh, later. Now it started in late November. That was the first service. And Christmas came along. An outreach was happening within a month of starting the church. It was Christmas, there were special meetings in the Adelphi Hall. Some of you might recognize that from uh, along the road there. It's now flats, but a special Christmas meeting with singing and a special message. And then after that uh, came open airs. And some of you here, I'm sure, will remember open air meetings um, that went on for many, many years in different parts of the of the prom in fact i think it was only the early 90s when they they stopped so it went on for decades um and then sunday by sunday the meetings went on and have a wee look at that i'm not sure if you read it but portobello town hall this is the town hall 1895 so the story here goes back a long long time and uh, they also had special meetings back then this is maybe a bit too small but it was an advert in 1913. It was tucked in the back of a, a deacon's minute book. That was in the church's first building in Stanley Street. And again, I hope to tell you more about that later. The man who printed the newspapers and also um, this leaflet was a man called Thomas Adams. And he was part of the church. He was a local printer along in what's now Figgott Street. Um, but he was able to use his skills for God as a printer. Uh, 1920s there was a new form of outreach and it was a tent and that went on for about 10 years in conjunction with Charlotte Chapel some years and they had meetings it, it's um, that is the actual tent and it was uh, sometimes it was um, near where the co-op is now or Mintoni Avenue that part of Bath Street sometimes it was nearer the prom but that must have been quite a sight it was known as the canvas cathedral <laughs> so there you are and then one area of outreach that has been always from the start has been with children. And we've seen the young ones here go out to their Sunday school. But right from the very, very earliest days, the message of the Lord Jesus was given to the children of the church. Not just here, actually. There were branch Sunday schools in Midley and in the Jewel Cottages. Um, and then later in, in Piers Hill, one of the deacons called Mr. MacDonald uh, was very instrumental in the Sunday school there and then later his son a man called Charlie MacDonald who again some of you will probably remember he used to take a bus and collect the children of Southfield and bring them into Sunday school and I believe it or not at its peak there were about 350 children on the Sunday school roll and I'm not sure where they packed them in but there they go <laughs> And they did holiday clubs as well. You've just had one, uh, looking at the banners downstairs. This one was 1970. And there was another one when Mr. Montgomery was the uh, pastor. And he told me that he arrived as there were um, meetings down by the sea. And they were launching a Noah's Ark into the sea. <laughs> so they are. Um, not just little children. I, I like this reference. This was when uh, Terry Gallagher was here. And he was invited to Portobello High School, this is the old one, now demolished, uh, to an event called Grill a Christian. So he was on the hot seat and apparently thoroughly enjoyed himself. Um, but not just children, the outreach was to older people as well. And in the 1980s, um, Mr. George Mitchell was here as, as the minister and he started what is still going as the old people's club. And that very highly decorated um, van was uh, ferrying people in and out. So um, that is an interesting story to come in September as well. The club still meets in a hall at the back that's been there for a mere 90, 90, 25, almost 100 years. 
Um, and it was also a place in the church where there was outreach to others who wouldn't necessarily normally come in. Church is not just for Christians, is it? It's for everybody. And so again, in the time of Terry Gallagher, there was a, a really vibrant outreach to those struggling with addictions. Um, in the times of Don Curry, there was an outreach with Bethany Christian Trust, again, to those really struggling, which was lovely. The church wasn't just looking for its own, but was looking out. So let's come back to missions and overseas missions. And that verse, go into all the world and share the gospel. Uh, but not everyone can go abroad, can they? Uh, what about here? Well, this was interesting. In the 1950s, there was a, you maybe not be able to see it, missionary exhibition. That's uh, Mr. White there with his clerical collar on. The young people put together a, an exhibition and many, many people came and heard. In fact, there was a, a missionary board put uh, together. It's had a wee bit worse for wear now, some broken glass, but pictures of all the people who went out from this church either to serve as pastors or as missionaries. So that takes us to the missionaries. And am I doing something wrong? Am I doing? There we go. There we go again. So the first mention of possibly a missionary from this church I found in 1918, a Miss McCracken um, missionary designate to South Africa. Now, she was involved in Sunday school work at the Jewel, and when she left, there was a, a big social for her, but um, not yet sure how she quite fitted in or if she even actually made it to South Africa. But then when we came to the 1920s, there were three really remarkable ladies, and this is partly why I showed you the pictures earlier, so you can put them in place. Three ladies who became doctors. Now we're talking the 1920s when ladies didn't really have um, the educational opportunities. But these three ladies became doctors and they were all associated with the church. So this is the first one and the picture on the left is very kindly from the Baptist Missionary Society archives. A lady called Ella Gregory. Her dad there on the right hand side was one of the deacons of the church and this is a picture of him. Now he was the man who really spearminded the buying of Stanley Street um, Church. And if any of you know the communion table there with the little plaque on it, that's in memory of Thomas Gregory who did so much for this church. So his daughter um, sailed out to India, a place called Berampur, in 1924. And she was there until the 1940s, so a really um, long stint. This is the hospital, thanks to the hospital out there, they allowed me to use this picture. And this is Ella a bit, a bit later on. And her services were really exceptional. In fact, she was presented with a medal from the Indian government for her services, the Kaiser I. Hind Medal for Distinguished Services. I think it's a wee bit like our NBEs or OBEs. So she must have been really exceptional. And when she died, her colleagues back in India dedicated a, a memorial prayer hall to her because they really thought so much of her. The same year that Ella went out, uh, Ruth Tate also went out. Now, this is, these super photos have come from the family, and David Tate was the very first, well, the man who had the very first service in Portobello uh, Baptist Church. So it was his daughter, and she went out exactly the same time as Ella, but Ruth went to China. And... Um, her application papers still exist, and I was sent some of them, and I just had to tell you this wee comment. Uh, it said that Ruth was possessed of a substantial amount of good common sense. <laughs> now, Ruth would need it. Wait till you hear her story. Um, it, this is her in the front row right in the middle uh, about a year after she went out. But uh, then in 1926 there was a, 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 a really terrible time of political turmoil in the place in China where she was, Xi'an Fu in Shenxi, sorry for my Chinese accent. Somebody described it as being like being on the, the Western Front in World War I, it was that bad. So she was surrounded by shelling. In fact, one day she left her office where she normally was and came back and there were bullet holes through the curtains. She would have been 
killed had she still been in that room. But here's what she wrote. This is where the, the common sense came through. 23rd of April, 1926. By the way, I know this because her diaries are up in the National Library of Scotland. Fascinating read. So here's what she said. Early this morning, a huge explosion woke us all up. But we returned to bed and all slept till the normal time. <laughs> I don't think I'd have been going back to bed. <laughs> But truthfully, she went through a really difficult time. They did actually have to flee for their lives, um, crossing a no man's land on narrow wooden boards over a big pit with firing going on. It was quite extraordinary. And after she left, she came home and put her feet up. No. <laughs> she actually went to India for a year to serve there. And then she went back to China and to the same place. And then in World War II, the hospital was bombed again, and she, she literally had to flee for her life. So that was twice. But she spent some time here, and she went back. And then in 1950, she had to flee again because of the communists. What makes a lady flee three times yet go back? Well, surely she was good soil, wasn't she, and wanted to share the seed. Um, and she was trusting her saviour, God was protecting her, and she wanted to work longer for him. So she came back and worked as a GP uh, in the 50s until she, until she retired here. So I, I better move on, sorry, I'm going rather quickly, uh, rather long. Maisie McGill <laughs> is the third one, and this was the daughter of Archibald McGill, who again was one of the very early pastors. I've not found her, a photograph of her yet, but the family very kindly is still looking. And this was the hospital she went to. She had four years, in fact, in India first, and then she went to Sierra Leone. This was the hospital there. And what I found really interesting about Maisie McGill, who's the cousin to Ruth Tate, by the way, um, she had a real focus on the health of women and girls. And so the hospital would be looking after ladies as they had their babies and the families, but she was also very interested in helping the missionaries. A lot of them were ladies, and she was instrumental in arguing successfully for longer furloughs, longer times at home, times of rest, because of the pressures they were under. So that was lovely. Sadly, her own health became poor, and she had to come home, but she served in a Methodist mission, GP practice in Bromley Street, and then when the NHS came, into being in 1948, she took over the practice and ran it as a GP practice for the NHS. So those were actually not members of the church, but very closely associated. They came back and they spoke in the church. But in the 1930s, the church had its very own missionary for the first time. So here we go, Dr. Hugh Craig. And here he is, thanks to, again, to the Angus Library, he actually grew up in the church, and when he told the church that he wanted to become a doctor, they helped to pay for some of his medical fees. And he was part of the Sunday school as a teacher and as a pianist. And he then was accepted by the Baptist Missionary Society to go out to India. And, sorry, it's too small. I put a little yellow blob, and it was a place in the Cond Hills called Udayagiri, something like that. And I had to read this. this. This was a church always sends its people off with great excitement. And the deacon's minutes, really, you, you got that sense that the church was thrilled that he was going. And they had a, a social event. So um, at that night, here I'm quoting, they gave him suitable gifts. And even better, he suitably replied. So all oh, <laughs> very suitable, very suitable. So he went out to India and his fiancée, this lady Gladys Benton, she was there as well, and they married out there. He went out in 1930. But very sadly, this is the hospital, very sadly he and she went down with a really severe form of malaria and had to be rushed home in 1932. And the doctor said, you're not allowed to go back. So less than two years in, they had to come to terms with really difficult news and sometimes God does send things into our lives with the, you know the difficulties that Glenn was talking about but they trusted him in fact they, they named their house in Edinburgh Udayagiri as a memory of the place they had loved and 
last little footnote came across many, many years later. In 1982, Dr. Craig died and left a legacy for the church. And he wanted something to be done in memory of Mr. Walker, who was the minister at the time. And uh, so they thought about perhaps um, buying new offering plates. But they started with a children's mission with Jimmy Slater, who some of you might remember. And uh, I think Dr. Craig would have been very pleased. But Mr. Walker was the minister, and the next missionary was his daughter, uh, Vera Walker. I think you can see a family resemblance there. Uh, she came to Portobello when she was about eight, when her dad became the minister. And her son uh, told me that she played a portable organ at some of those tent meetings that were going on. Um, well, she left Sunday school and became a teacher, and she also helped uh, with the Cubs. And this super photo is of a scout jamboree, and she was there. I've tried to enlarge it, but it's a wee bit grainy. She's in on the left, and her older sister was the Cub leader on the right. Um, so she was very involved. She graduated in 1928, and she didn't just graduate. She won three prizes including being the most distinguished woman student of the year in Edinburgh. <laughs> so there you are. Now, she went out um, in 1932, and this time I can tell you what the church gave her. So surgical equipment and an electric reading lamp, cutlery, and some linen. So most suitable, I think. <laughs> but um, they also had a special parcel. I thought this was actually really lovely. It, it was a bundle tied up with a tartan ribbon. But in the bundle were 30 letters written by church members so that she could read one every day on the boat on the way to India. Oh, that was really nice. She also went to India, and she's on the right-hand side, a place called Berampur, and the other yellow is where Hugh Craig was, so actually quite close. She was working with Ella Gregory in the same hospital, and uh, she was also helping at an English-speaking church. Now, at that church, there was a man. His name was Lionel Horwell. <laughs> and he was a judge. And uh, they fell in love. And they married. Now, in those days, when you married, you, you actually stopped formally working. Um, and so they had, a, they had a honeymoon. And then it says she did individual medical work. So she seems to have resigned from the BMS, but then gone on to do work on her own. So I'm on now to somebody, you probably don't know those names, but I think some of you here will know this name, Winnie Haddon, a name that always makes all of us smile. Um, so here's Winnie, um, just when she was going out actually in the 1940s, she was a school teacher and part of the choir here in the Sunday school here. And it was quite interesting, when, when Winnie came it was Mr. White was the minister, and then a man called uh, James Taylor. Now, James was previously a missionary in the Congo. And the lovely thing here was he also translated some of the scriptures into the local language. And I just wonder, because Winnie went out to the Congo, if perhaps in talking to James Taylor there was a link there. It might be. So this super photo came from the Baptist Missionary Society as well. Um, she sailed to the Congo in 1947 to a place called Natondo. And she worked there for 10 years. How do you fancy going by canoe to uh, your place of work? But that's where she was. And this other photo was um, of her beside um, a lake having a bit of, a, a, bit of a, a time out with another of the nurse. Her first time home was 1950. And I was chatting to one of the young girls who was here at the time, and she presented her with a bouquet of flowers to say, um, welcome back. I had a wee speech, and I believe she might even be here today. <laughs> um, here's the church. What happened was, after being in the Congo about 10 years, she was asked to go to a different place called Yalemba. And this church is in Yalemba. It came from a, a, a magazine online. It wasn't all easy for Winnie. In fact, um, in 1957, she wrote this lovely card home. She drew a Congo um, talking drum. That's what that is. And then the church did a, or she, in fact, did a, a, a tape where she recorded a bit of singing from the children in the school, and they um, did one back in 1960. Now, 1960 was the year when Congo became independent from uh, Belgium, 
And in fact, it became so dangerous for white people that she had to be evacuated. So she came home. She, she went back later on, though. And in the late 70s, she helped to reopen a Bible school um, in a place called Yakusu. So she really had a long time out there, 25 years. And then Mama Haddon, as she was known, had to retire. But she never stopped loving her African friends. And um, when she came back here, she simply stopped working in one way and started working in another. And she was really involved in all the church activities. These are um, Sunday school pictures of a Sunday school picnic as she was, as she was helping. So after, after Winnie, there was a little a bit of a, a gap before the next missionary went out. And um, this time it was a couple. He was a printer, just like the Thomas Adams from the early days. This super photo came from... Um, their son. So Norman and Dorothy Moxie. Dorothy had grown up in the church and Norman came later. And they had a valedictory service when Mr. Milstead was the minister here. And that's a, that's a copy of the actual leaflet that they had. And apparently it was an unforgettable experience. That's what the minute said when they went out. So this is where he was working. This is the uh, Baptist Missionary Press in Calcutta in India. And uh, this is the Cary Baptist Church in India as well. So they were really walking on the shoulders of giants, William Cary, most of us have heard of. And they took some time out to sightsee. There's Dorothy in some uh, Indian dress and there with their little boy. They actually came back in 1968 and they had a, a social here and then they actually moved away. And so um, they moved to Wester Hills and became founder members of that new church. So still working for God in Edinburgh, just in a different way. Now, the next one is um, Marilyn Mills, another young girl who grew up in the church. And she also felt the call to India. In fact, she was very active in the youth fellowship. And this super picture came from her family. She's the one in the dark jacket, uh, the second on the left. The young people in the 50s and 60s were incredibly active. This was an outreach in air that they were doing. And she was part of that group. And um, so she went out um, to s India as well with the BMS. She was a nurse. She'd, in fact, been speaking to Winnie Haddon one day when the spark and the call to missions uh, came to Marilyn, and she felt she needed to go. And so here's her hospital in a place called Diptipur. And she went out at the end of 1965. Now, when she was there... It really felt like a real partnership, and that's where maybe a church doesn't realize the impact it has, but there was such a partnership between the church and Marilyn. Food was difficult in those days. There were times when the monsoons didn't come, and in fact, in 1974, she wrote that there was an almost total crop failure, so people were in fear, um, and what did the church do? Well, in 1974, they sent 70 pounds to buy a cow. So they are. Did you know the church was the sponsor of a cow? Well, it was, and that made such a difference. And then it was interesting. I read in, in an article that at times Marilyn felt like Daniel walking into the lion's den with all the need around about her. But she also remembered that Daniel's God was her God, and he would provide, and so he did. Now, the next, there's only two to go now. Uh, the next couple were Roland and Kathy Bell, and they um, came to the church on a furlough. So they actually had gone out before, um, but Kathy's Auntie Doris lived in Portobello, and they would come on their furloughs. Um, Kathy was a nurse, and Roland had um, trained as a psychiatric nurse, but he was also a Bible teacher. That was his main uh, role there. Um, here are the family on a, on a furrow coming back. And I just thought I'd give you an idea. The missionaries before had sailed to where they needed to go. But here's what happened to Kathy. She sailed to Singapore. She then had a truck to the local railway station. She then had a five-hour train journey. She then got on a bus, which she actually described as a very old truck with wooden seats. And that was four or five hours to get to the next stop, and presumably very, very stiff and dusty. She had a meal with some missionaries there, and then she had to be paddled up the river by canoe. So this wasn't just 
hopping in her car. It was really, really um, taxing. They were in Thailand, and uh, she worked as a nurse. And it was interesting. People viewed missionaries, anybody, with a lot of suspicion. But there was also leprosy that was quite rife. And they realized that the nurses could really help those patients with leprosy. And soon they were able to tell them about the Lord Jesus as well as they were helping them. Um, Roland, on the other hand, um, was going about on his motorbike. And he often took a motorbike onto a small boat to get around. And he wanted to teach the Bible in a way that was culturally appropriate. So he took a number of years to develop a home Bible seminary, a set of um, Bible teaching materials. But he also... Um, mention some of the highs and lows of missionary life. How would you like to come back from a holiday to find like termites had eaten through all of his books? <laughs> and he, was, he loved books, but then people started sending him Banner of Truth books, and that was great. Or one time he was mugged by four bandits when he was on his motorbike, and they stole his, his backpack, which had his Bible in it, which he had marked all his favorite verses and his study notes. But very thankfully, the Bible came back. So God, God was looking after them. And there were lovely other times as well. It wasn't all hardship. Um, they came back often. And um, their daughter sent this photograph. This is when they had their silver wedding anniversary. And uh, Mr. Gellatry is there in the middle. They had a special um, event at church. And uh, they retired back to Portobello and threw themselves into the work of the church. Uh, Roland became a deacon. And um, the one on the right-hand side is with Andy Scarcliffe when um, she was having her 90th birthday. So it was lovely. The church was able to welcome them as part of the family at home. And then the final family I wanted to talk to you about was Brunton and Sheila Scott. Um, Brunton, again, um, grew up in Portobello Baptist Church. And as a young man, he went down to Spurgeon's College and um, became a minister and went to St. Andrew's Baptist Church. And early on in their marriage, their son was telling me that um, Sheila said to Brunton, you know, I'm really interested in missions. And Brunton said, yes, yes, I'm interested too. But the word interested can mean many things. And in her mind, she was thinking of being a missionary. And in his mind, he was thinking of an interest in missions. And about three or four years later, um, he said to her, do you know, I'm really interested in missions now and going out. And she was dismayed because she had three children by then. <laughs> so the Lord has a sense of humor. And they did go overseas, actually. They went out to Brazil. And I apologize for my um, pronunciation, but I'll just say they went to the uh, interior of Brazil. <laughs> Perhaps I should say it. And a, a state of Paraná and no paved roads, electricity, um, no indoor toilets, and the paraffin run for a fridge. Sometimes Sheila apparently would look and wonder, oh, could we not have a grey Edinburgh day because there was never a cloud in the sky. But they worked there. He was a pastor there and had a real focus on young people. And she used her nursing skills to help. Um, but with the schooling situation, that was really quite difficult with the family. And so ultimately they came back and he went to Queen's Park Baptist church uh, through in Glasgow and then unexpectedly in the late 70s the Baptist Missionary Society said um, would you like to go back and be our regional representative and so they had to really wrestle with that question would they go back they would have to leave some family at home here and go out but they did for about two years and then they came home again and um, went to Kakantiluch Baptist Church and in that time, he was also elected as the president of the Baptist Union of Scotland. So this is him and his presidential address. Uh, one world, one task. I thought, just pause on that a wee minute and come back to it. But those are the missionaries so far. Who's going to be next? They had very exciting lives. They had very difficult times. Yet they served the Lord Jesus with everything they had. Nurses doctors, printers, teachers, everyone can be used. But what about today? How do you go from that to today? Do you have to be an overseas missionary? One world, one task? What's the task? 
just letting everybody know the good news that the Lord Jesus has come. And so there are new opportunities today. There's no right or wrong way to be a missionary. Today there's short-term missions opportunities, and this was a little um, clipping from one of the young people of the church who went out for a short time to Albania. But there's outreach right along Portobello High Street. I thought there's the community fridge that you do. Might be talking to people as you meet them in the shops. It might be warm spaces. Um, might be praying. Might be giving. And it might be going. Might be helping others who are out on the field. And these are the three mission organizations that you're helping today. What about football? What about the jigsaw club? They're all parts of the way we can show the love of the Lord Jesus in this town. So just to finish, I'm trying to think, how do you finish after such inspirational people? But this was a story I wanted to tell you from the very beginning of the church, 1905. And the man on the right is a man called Fraser Campbell, who was your first full-time pastor. And one night, he was walking along the prom at the end of the year, and he saw the moon and the, the silvery line of the moon. And by the way, it took us about 20 attempts to get that photograph. <laughs> That's Portobello prom. But there he was. He was walking along the prom. He saw the moon and he thought, there's a lovely light coming from the moon. I would love the town of Portobello to come to know the light of the world. The light of the world is another name for the Lord Jesus Christ. So he longed for the people of Portobello to know the Savior. And that's what he did when he was here. He preached and he encouraged and he helped the young people to catch the vision as the next generation. And then I thought, what about today? Well, this was you last year um, at Christmas time, the carols on the beach. And what does it say? Out of darkness, the light shall shine. We're dark, aren't we? Everyone is dark in the sense of struggles, illnesses poverty, whatever it is, but most of all, we're dark inside. The Bible calls that sin, doesn't it? But the Lord Jesus has come to cleanse. He's come to heal that darkness. He's come to dispel it because he is the light of the world. So what a privilege for us. We can sow the seed here in Portobello. We can sow the seed at the farthest part of the world. But you have such a legacy here. All these people that have blazed the trail ahead and Praise God for us here today in this town, and may we all go worshipping him and wanting to serve him. Thank you.